These people are scientists, directors, and portfolio managers. This guy is a drug discovery project leader. They have one thing in common. They all failed to check relevant target engagement early in their projects, so they can't see where they're heading. That's risky. Ouch. Let's make sure it doesn't happen in your project. Hi, everyone, and uh, <clears throat> welcome to this Pelago Bioscience webinar. I think it's uh, 5 uh, p.m. CET sharp, so I think people will, uh, will keep dropping in. But uh, let's, uh, let's get started as it's time. Thank you all for taking the time to join, join today. Today's webinar uh, will talk about expanding the scope in drug discovery with the new setsable targets. My name is Joachim, Business Development Manager here at Pelago Bioscience, and I will start with a short introduction about Pelago and the SETSA technology. Then my colleague, Helena Almquist, a senior scientist here at Pelago, will uh, <clears throat> walk through the new SETSA targets. First, talking about how Pelago validated these new targets, uh, going through the lab work and the example data, and then also going through some internal R&D project utilizing the SETSA technology, um, so the Navigate HD technology for primary screening. If you have any questions, um, please uh, write them in the chat, as in the end, we will uh, have a Q&A session uh, where we'll do our best to answer uh, any questions that you might have. So I'll kick off with uh, telling you a bit more about uh, Pelago Bioscience. <clears throat> Pelago Bioscience, uh, we are a specialized CRO focusing on the SETS technology, uh, which for which we have the uh, control of the IP. And uh, we, so we focus on, uh, on that as our core, core assay. But as a company, we continue to develop and we seek to push the boundaries in, in drug discovery. So today we offer uh, services extending beyond SETSA, SETSA, but still focusing on biologically relevant assays. Uh, and we aim to deliver smart assay services to uh, help driving drug discovery projects forward. We have our, our full team, including our expert R&D team uh, in our state-of-the-art facilities here in Stockholm, Sweden. So going into uh, to sets and why it's valuable. So for a drug to be effective and safe, uh, the compound must bind to the, uh, to the target protein at the intended site of action a process known as target engagement. That this is a crucial throughout the drug discovery process uh, from target validation <coughs> to uh, hit confirmation, uh, from, <laughs> from uh, target validation through hit confirmation in uh, preclinical studies. And uh, <coughs> so about the, the technology, how can SETSA help you navigate your chemistry and explore the biology? So SETSA is a label-free method. Uh, <clears throat> so it enables you to assess target engagement in intact cells. So closer to the actual physiological conditions that your drug is intended to act in. It's based on a core protocol uh, consisting of four steps. We uh, treat uh, cells with compound, heat across a temperature range, and then separate uh, at each uh, temp temperature step, we separate the uh, folded protein from the denatured protein. And then we detect the amount of fold, folded protein that is remaining in uh, the soluble fraction. We can uh, detect uh, the remaining protein uh, with two different detection methods. Either our targeted format, the SETSA Navigate, which is utilizing antibody-based detection, or SETSA Explore for uh, protein-wide uh, drug profiling utilizing mass spec detection. Sets of work with uh, any sample type. We have worked with everything from standard cell lines to uh, primary cells, PBMCs, uh, tissue homogenates, and even bacteria and plants. So it can be utilized for most uh, sample matrices. <clears throat> so sets in drug discovery. 
today. Uh, SETS has been used across all stages of the drug discovery uh, process. We have used it in over 300 different projects. It's valuable both in target-based drug discovery, used for lead generation, hit confirmation, and then confirmation of target engagement before preclinical development. We also have the uh, mass spec format, as I mentioned, which is useful for <coughs> uh, protein-wide drug profiling. You can use it for mode of action deconvolution, um, biomarker searches, or uh, uh, mode of action studies. So the SETSA principle is based on the thermal profile of proteins how they degrade with increasing temperature. As is illustrated here, uh, we have a native, native protein and increasing the, the temperature uh, increases the amount of protein that denatures, uh, as is represented here by, by the blue line. If we add a drug, uh, the, uh, drug the drug may uh, induce a thermal shift of the protein uh, when it binds to the protein. As, it, as illustrated here uh, by the dotted line, where the uh, drug protein complex has uh, a, a different thermal profile uh, compared to the native protein, uh, also called a thermal shift. And this is what we're looking at using the SETSA technology. As we will be focusing on the high throughput format of SETSA today, I like to just briefly highlight how we, how we then detect the remaining uh, uh, soluble uh, native folded protein. So we utilize a dual antibody uh, bead-based uh, proximity system where a uh, native protein allows for a binding of both antibodies and the proximity of the beads generating a signal while the denatured protein does not allow for generation of the signal. And this is how we can separate between the uh, still folded protein and the denatured protein in, in solution. So today's focus is on the new setsable uh, targets and the Navigate HT format, but I would also like to go through the other different formats that uh, we have available using the SETSA technology. We have the SETSA Navigate format. This is uh, utilizing Western blot based detection. It's ideal for when you have, for example, five to 10 compounds. Uh, to confirm target engagement or to uh, for translational studies when you need to progress your project into the next step. Then, as we will focus on today, the Navigate HT format, uh, plate-based system uh, using alpha lysa and HTRF for detection, uh, applied for screening, hit confirmation, and SAR analysis. And then also the protein-wide SETSA uh, using mass spec detection for protein-wide uh, drug profiling. So the start of the show today is the SETSA Navigate high throughput format. This is, as mentioned, a dual antibody plate-based method. The uh, uh, workflow is as illustrated here by the, uh, this slide. We first incubate the cells with compounds. Uh, we heat shock, then we lyse the cells, and then we add the detection consumables. <clears throat> uh, the detection, as mentioned, is using here the uh, proximity bead-based system, uh, luminescence-based detection, and the uh, difference in the uh, uh, thermal profile of the of a dimeso control and native protein and the protein compound complex is as illustrated here down in the middle by the melt and shift curve, where the blue line indicates the thermal profile of the native protein, and the uh, bronze and green lines demonstrates the shifted thermal profiles of the uh, compound protein complexes. Here we also um, determine the ideal temperature, uh, the ideal window for when we would like to continue doing isothermal concentration response screening uh, for uh, EC50 determination uh, of your compounds using doing, for example, a screening campaign. Some applications of uh, how SETSA Navigate HD has been used. Uh, it's been used in, uh, in screening. Uh, it's been used, uh, as is illustrated here, uh, uh, with the Sanofi data. It's been used in uh, compound library screening uh, against timidulate synthase of around 12,000 compounds. 
It's also been used in a MEC1 fragment library screen, where the follow up uh, concentration response screening for hit confirmation show uh, that uh, sets is useful even for lower affinity molecules like fragments. Then it has also been used in hit confirmation. Uh, in this example, we see uh, to the right, for example, we see the sets HT data correlated to a functional readout uh, and a good correlation here between the functional readout and the cellular target engagement uh, strengthens the, the target validation. And this is also, as I mentioned in the beginning, also, also why, one of the reasons that we have uh, started to include additional relevant uh, cellular-based assays here at Pelago to do this kind of correlations where you can correlate the uh, target engagement, the sets of data with the, uh, a with the efficacy data from a functional assay. And uh, down in the middle, uh, we also show how uh, sets HD can be used for SAR work, where you, you can use the sets AC50 data for ranking and prioritizing lead series and using this uh, in your SAR work to guide compound design. And with uh, walking, by walking through these applications, I would like to hand over to my colleague Helena to talk you through the uh, pre-validated sets of targets. So thank you very much for that, Joachim. I will start by... So, okay, thank you very much. Um, so now it's my turn to go into the, the major topic of today to actually talk about the launch of the new sensible targets. But before that, I will just mention that after that presentation, I will go back and, and highlight and, and talk about some applications and, uh, that we've done in-house uh, on a primary screening on two targets using this as a Navigate HT. So, but as I said, the topic of today is to um, um, launch the new sets of all targets. Um, uh, so by a rapid screening approach, Pelago have successfully pre-validated a range of new total alpha as a sure kits using the sets of Navigate HT format. And as Joachim already said that we are working with the alpha technology and uh, the SETSA method in combination with this alpha technology can really give exceptional results and build confidence earlier in drug discovery projects. So with this new strategy that we have, uh, we're now launching and the this screening approach, we are now launching 41 new targets that are available for uh, sets of studies. So in this slide um, highlights the, uh, or shows the over, now over 50 targets that are, have been used in sets of HT uh, navigate format. And uh, we just wanna highlight the different localizations that the targets uh, belong to. It's both nuclear cytoplasmic targets and, and membrane associated targets. Uh, and uh, that's a growing list of, of uh, target classes. We have enzymes, kinases, transcription factors, translation initiation factors, and adaptive proteins. Um, and I just wanna stay a bit longer so you can really try to see what, what target names there is, but uh, we will get back to this list, of course. And you can also contact Pelago if, if your uh, protein is not on the list as well. Um, so uh, why did we come up with this approach to, to do this rapid screening approach? Well, uh, we uh, previously we have sets of validated one target at a time or one kit at a time and full, done a full validation, but we really wanted to increase the number of sets of targets. So we thought that we could uh, come up with a new approach. And the key questions that we wanted to answer was that, is the target detectable in common cell lines using the high throughput alpha technology? And does the target have an optimal melting profile? So is it suitable for target engagement sets of studies? So can we detect it? Can it be melted? And also, does the assay have a good quality? And is the assay suitable for sets of target engagement measurements of small molecule target interactions? So I'm going to go into in, in more detail how the, the actual lab work was done and how the experimental design. But Again, I just want to highlight that this was a rapid screening approach of many targets at the same time. And since we applied the same screening conditions on all targets, we considered the targets or the kits to be pre-validated, but the data is still very high quality and we have high confidence in the data. Uh, and then saying the showing sensible, uh, meaning detectable and meltable. So, uh, this is a slide showing how we actually designed the study. Uh, so from the beginning, we needed to select what targets to start with uh, and also what cell lines to, to, to screen or to look into. 
And we also needed to decide what acid conditions. And as I said, we wanted to apply the same acid conditions for all targets. So we needed to come up with an optimal um, acid protocol for all targets. So based on previous experience, we ended up with 10,000 cells per well and the set salysis buffer three um, was used throughout the study. And then we also wanted to do a quality assessment of the asset conditions and workflow before we actually did the, the screening. And that we did with already pre-validated uh, kits. Then when we had set the conditions and the workflow, we then performed the actual screening campaign and screening meaning that we screened a lot of kits. And we did that in two steps. So first we did a six temperature melt curve profile in two cell lines. And then we selected uh, one cell line to move forward with. And also for the qualified targets, we moved into a full temperature melt curves. Uh, melt curves. Uh, and we repeated that uh, experiment over two to three days to gain confidence in the data. And then as a next step, uh, we also wanted to verify target engagement for some of the targets that had available uh, tool compounds. So we also have done full melt and shift curves for selected targets um, with available tool compounds. And then of course, I just wanna highlight that, that if there are no tool compounds available, uh, which is the case for some targets, there is of course a future potential application uh, that you can do uh, primary screening and identify novel tools using sets of library screening with these kits for detection. So going back to the experimental design, how we actually um, yeah, um, came up with the idea, uh, and we went through the whole um, Perkin Elmer Alpha Kit catalog. We identified 166 unique uh, Uniprot IDs. And then we went to Human Protein Atlas and extracted the mRNA level uh, expression data for all of these targets. By looking at this, combining the data and doing a big, big bioinformatics study, we saw that 109 targets had uh, mRNA expression levels over two in two commonly used cell lines, U2OS and THP1 cells. And out of those 109 targets, we then selected 46 alpha Lysa surefire ultra kit uh, based on that uh, the target is, is uh, not secreted and the target has not previously been set so validated and the kits were ready available. And we also wanted to use the same bead chemistry since it was easier for logistical reasons in the lab to use a kit with the same uh, assay protocol. And then we did, as I said, a feasibility study, a quality assessment of the assay conditions and workflow. And we did use the previously validated um, sets of validated kits to check the optimal assay conditions. And as I said, we, we, um, we ended at 10,000 cells per well and in this study, we compared three different lysis buffers because we have seen that that is highly critical and different targets are localized differently and the, the lysis buffer is really critical. So we compared lysis buffer one being a harsh, um, a harsh uh, lysis buffer, two being the mildest detergent and three being a medium detergent uh, uh, lysis buffer. Uh, and here, uh, the heat map in the middle shows uh, an example data from THP1 cells with uh, 15 targets, I think, and then it's uh, the different lysis buffers. And you can immediately see that lysis buffer one and, and three uh, standing out that gives a higher signal. In general, the lysis buffer two produced uh, lower signals in general. And we have also a panel of, of example data from a previously validated kit, MEC that they all uh, produce very nice melt curves, but you see that the signal were generally higher for, for the L lysis buffer three. So that was why we selected the lysis buffer three to move forward. You can also here see that the mRNA level um, that we extracted from human protein atlas correlate really well with the detection that into you, in the U2 OS cells for MEC, we have higher expressions than in the THB1 cells. So, and then we moved into the actual uh, screening of the new kits. Uh, and as I said, we selected 46 kits, uh, total Surefire Ultra uh, kits. And in the first step, we did this six temperature melt curve profile in both cell lines. So the, uh, the targets were either expressed in both or in one of the cell lines. And the first example here is PLC gamma two and one and two. And as you can see, they have different expression levels in the two cell lines, but nicely, nice high signals and also nice melting profile. For elongation factor 2A and 4E, 
we see a later melting. It melts, um, it's a more stable protein. Uh, but you also see a quite high uh, expression and also nice detection and also quit a uh, bit cell specific uh, melting profile. For the SMADS family, uh, we had um, SMAD1, 2, and 3. And here you can see that they are uh, again highly expressed and they have exactly the same melt profile in both TP1 cells and UTOAs for SMAD2 and 3, whereas SMAD1 is only expressed in uh, UTOA cells in accordance with human protein atlas. So conclusion from this step one was that we do see different melting profiles and the temperature range were therefore adjusted for step two. We see a cell line specific expression um, and then we therefore choose one of the cell lines uh, for the next round of screening. And 41 of in total 46 kits were qualified for step two. And qual in this case qualified means that during, under these acid conditions, we saw a melting and a nice detection. For some of the proteins we detected them but they couldn't melt and Maybe they also needed some other lysis buffer, et cetera. So the assay one was not optimized. So for the 41 qualified kits, we then moved into and did full 12 temperature melt curve studies over two to three days in one of the cell lines. And here's six examples of, of these um, new targets. And their data is visualized in an informatics system called signal screening. Um, and um, the visualization is done in Spotfire, and this is from Perkin Elmer. The, the data has been plotted and, and visualized by Perkin Elmer. And this slide down here shows the wide melting range of all the 41 targets. It's a very busy slide, but you, you can see that it's a very wide uh, range of, of melting profiles. And the conclusion from, from this uh, screening is that we successfully generated full melt curve for 41 pro protein targets, a very high success rate, 89% uh, were qualified from the in total 46 uh, kit screen, high quality data and robust and stable assay performance all through. And this slide just, just I wanted to show you all the 41 new targets that you can, um, yeah, again, just have a, a brief look at the Quite difficult to read the names, maybe, but um, this this um, slide will slide deck will be possible to to get after. Um, so, uh, as I said, we also wanted to, in addition to doing this uh, screening approach and and um, um, launching these new sensible targets, we wanted to verify target engagement for some of them that had available tool compounds in the literature. So, here are some example data. For example, uh, the first one is RIPK1. Uh, we purchased two RIPK1 inhibitors, uh, and as you can see, they induce a nice stabilizing uh, thermal profile. For MLKL, another kinase, a mixed lineage kinase domain-like protein, uh, we also have two inhibitors from the literature, one being an ATP mimetic, and these uh, destabilize MLKL and, under these conditions in intact cells. Then we have a six spleen tyrosine kinase, uh, where we have three tool compounds, one uh, heavily destabilizing the protein, whereas the other two, uh, phosphatinib and its uh, active met metabolite, uh, R406, have a, induce a, a smaller shift, smaller destabilizing shift. Then we have a few examples of uh, cell surface membrane receptors. We have FDFR1 and 2. Uh, the two compounds, um, tested on these targets. They are multi-target inhibitors, so they target both. And infigratinib is an FGFR family inhibitor, and they both nicely stabilize and uh, engage the target. You can also see here that FGFR1 melts and have a TEM of approximately 48 degrees, whereas uh, FGFR2 has a TEM of about 50 degrees. So even they are closely related, they have a different melting profile. And then the last case is insulin-like growth factor one uh, receptor. And here we have profile two inhibitors as well, and they nicely stabilize uh, EGFR1 as well. So again, uh, uh, these are 18 new uh, targets that we have done melt and shift curve studies for. And just want to highlight a few of them uh, very shortly. PLC gamma one and two, we have profile a PLC inhibitor that both stabilize these two targets. And then we have SHP1 and 2 that also have selective inhibitors that stabilize the targets. And then we have an example of uh, elongation factor 2A in retinoblastoma that uh, we have an example of 
compounds binding the upstream target and then affecting this pathway. So for retinoblastoma, for example, which is the downstream target of uh, CDK4, we have uh, um, um, the cells have been incubated with palbociclib being a CDK4 inhibitor, and then we affect retinoblastoma thermal profile. So uh, to summarize, um, we, we have done a successful uh, rapid screening approach and successfully validated or pre-validated for 41 new targets for SETSA HT using the alpha technology. Uh, and again, same assay conditions has been applied. So that's we, why we call them pre-validated, even though the data has been of very high quality, robust and stable assays, and the workflow is, is truly amenable for automation and high throughput screening purposes. Yes, so, and that was the uh, end of that presentation. And then I will move forward with um, um, going into some um, applications of uh, library screening. So first of all, I want to uh, just set the scene of, of uh, that um, um, introducing you to two primary screening campaigns but done by uh, the industry. So first we have Vertex that um, collaborated with Pelago. The assay was developed at Pelago. Uh, they had a target that was very challenging to drug. The target uh, is in a multi-protein complex and no small molecule binders were currently known for this. And the different uh, uh, in the complex were difficult to express in vitro. Uh, but Vertex screened a 50,000 K library screen using SETSA and the result delivered new chemical scaffolds not identified in other screens. So a true success uh, that SETSA could deliver uh, an add value in this drug discovery program. And then AstraZeneca has screened um, uh, CRAF using an alpha LISA show for ultra detection kit that was validated by Pelago. And the hits confirmed known CRAF chemistry, but also uh, type 1 and type 2 and potential allosteric inhibitors were identified, as well as hits without known kinase structure. So this really shows that the SETSA HD library screening can really uh, add value and you can identify um, mode of different mode of action compounds. Uh, in a true physiological setting. So Pelago also wanted to do an internal screening campaign to really broaden the understanding and, and really increase the knowledge with about what SETSA and uh, primary screening using SETSA can deliver. So we selected uh, two different targets, CDK4, as I mentioned previously. It's a well-established onco target uh, and the indication is cancer. Uh, we have, uh, well, there are some marketed drugs or many marketed drugs, SETSA ability is high. Uh, and the potential added value using SETSA is that it's a new screening approach for this target. So it has the potential to actually add and, and um, uh, to uh, identify novel, novel chemistry. Sting was the other uh, target that we choose, a little bit more complex biology. So if CDK4 is within the box, this was maybe more out of the box target. It's validated for immune oncology and, and inflammation. No marketed drugs yet, and it's quite hot target on the in the industry right now also high sensibility and here we have the potential of screening for both agonists and antagonists since uh, there's been different mode of action uh, reported on on this target so we first started to uh, the assays were validated using these surefire ultra kits in two different cell lines and then uh, we started with a library selection. So we wanted to screen the same library against both targets so they can function as each other's uh, counter screen since it's the same readout in bead chemistry. Uh, we had a, uh, the library consisted of a focus set, lead like compounds, pressed wick, which is uh, already annotated drugs, and also fragment like compounds. The pre screening that we did prior to the primary screening campaign consisted of a robustness test of the automated workflow. We done, did cell factor calculations at different temperatures to really find the most optimal screening temperature. And we also based the, the temperature selection based on the results with tool compounds. In the primary screening campaign, we used pre-spotted plates and we worked all the way through in three to four well format. Final concentration uh, we screened at was 50 micromolar. And then after the screening campaign, we followed up all the hits from both uh, target screens on, in both assays. So all the hits from CDK4 and all the hits from CD, uh, Sting were uh, mixed together and then we screened them on both targets to again function as a, as a counter screen. Uh, 
And we screen them at 50, 10, and 2.5 micromolar to have a small three-point concentration response data. And then where we are today, and we have a smoking hot data directly come, came from the reader last week, we have done full concentration response curves of some of the selected hits. So uh, just want to highlight a few things about the, uh, the, the pre-screen uh, of uh, CDK4. And this is those is the pharmacological validation using some tool compounds. Uh, so this um, assay was developed in THB1 cells. And here are three tool compounds nicely stabilizing CDK4, palbociclib, as already mentioned, ribociclib, and abemaciclib. And we selected 46 degrees uh, as screening temperature. And uh, this is the data from the pre-screen and the assay was really robust with a um, stabilizing assay window of 0 0.8. And then for sting, um, the melt and shift curves look a bit different. As I said, there are different modalities. So sting melts nicely. And then we have an agonist, diabsi sting, which is a, which, diabsi, which is a GSK compound that massively stabilizes sting here, as you can see. And then we have two covalent inhibitors that destabilize sting. So the, the trick was here to find or to identify a temperature where you can identify both uh, destabilizing compounds, but also stabilizing compounds. And after doing some tests, we selected 51 degrees as a screening temperature. And then moving into some, some highlights from the screen campaign, this is just a plate layout saying that, um, that we populated the, the compounds in column one to 20. And then we had some internal controls cells incubated with DMSO as an isothermal control. And then we had positive and negative control um, being unheated cells and fully denaturated uh, protein where cells have been heated to 70 degree. This scatter plot shows uh, the data for CDK4 and the dotted line represents the uh, normalized values for the unheated cells or the controls. And then the red dotted line here represents the uh, normalized value for the fully heated or denaturated protein. The dotted line in the middle is the isothermal control. And then these, the color dots in between is all the small molecules applied in the screening campaign. And as you can see here uh, that we identify uh, many preliminary stabilizing hits. And the hit rate was around 1.2% in the screen. For Sting, it interestingly looked uh, very different. As you can see, uh, we applied the same library and uh, as you can see, where I do identify some stabilizing hits, a fewer hit uh, lower hit rate for the stabilizing hits, 0.2. But the interesting thing is that we identify a massive amount of destabilizing hits, and it appears to be library dependent as well. Uh, but then we, as I said, we took all the stabilizing hits and also the destabilizing hits from both screen screens, and we did a hit confirmation screen at three concentrations, 50, 10, and 2.5. Uh, the graph to the left illustrates the correlation plot between the highest concentration, the primary screening 50 micromolar versus the highest concentration in the hit confirmation screen. And you do see that there's a very nice correlation between the data. We confirm the stabilizing hits here. And then this is the hits that we uh, were identified in the sting screen that has no effect on CDK4. And to the right, we have some example of uh, stabilizing hits that nicely stabilize CDK4 at three different concentrations. And then we have the reference compounds, palbociclib being a potent stabilizer of um, CDK4. So same results for sting, uh, same compounds followed up and we do uh, get a nice correlation. We, uh, we confirm the stabilizing hits again, and we also confirm uh, many of the destabilizing hits. In between here, we have some compounds that has no effect on, on sting, but has an, a stabilizing effect on CDK4. And again, some example of the three-point concentration response curves of some stabilizing hits. And the reference compounds, Diabsi, this potent GSK compound that uh, massively stabilized thing. And then the covalent inhibitor being a destabilizer. So nicely correlated uh, data uh, correlating what we saw in the pharmacological validation. So to summarize uh, that uh, we have now done a successful primary screening campaign on these two targets and we are full focus forward and we have done the concentration response and we are now planning for doing melt and shift curves for selected compounds and to do functional assays as well to really see that they have an um, effect uh, on the target as well. 
So uh, with these examples and also with the with the Vertex and AstraZeneca case, this really shows the potential for using uh, sets and Navigate HD in primary screening, that it can give you an added value and also potentially um, um, identify compounds with different mode of actions um, yeah, in a true physiological setting in intact cells. So with that, I'll leave over to Joachim again. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Helena, for that great walkthrough. <clears throat> so to summarize today's webinar, uh, we have pre-validated 41 new targets uh, using the uh, uh, Navigate HT format. And if you would like to be, if you'd be interested in hearing more about uh, uh, these setable targets and how to uh, start working with this, you are very welcome to reach out to us at Pelago Bioscience or to Perkin Elmer. If you want to purchase a, uh, a start reusing these targets, you can purchase a kit and it sets a license buffer from Perkin Elmer. Then you can purchase a license from us at Pelago Bioscience. And this is all you need to, to get started and utilize uh, the SETSA HD technology for these pre-validated targets in-house. If you uh, are interested in additional target proteins, uh, here at Pelago Bioscience, we also uh, provide bespoke SETSA services and can develop an assays for your, your specific target of interest. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, conclude today's webinar, uh, but also leave the floor open to questions. So as I mentioned in uh, the beginning of today's webinar, uh, please feel free to write any questions you might have in the uh, chat, and we'll do our best to, uh, to go through all the questions that come in. Open up the chat. So <clears throat> um, we have a few questions that are coming. I'm going to let uh, Helena back into, into the picture here. So the first question that we have gotten is, in the case of uh, JNA, J, JNK12, do you know which? <laughs> now another question came in, so I need to go up again. Uh, do you know which one is the target there? Uh, no, uh, that kit is, is um, detecting both uh, both isoforms, so it's both. It's going to detect both. It's a total kit for junk one and two. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the next question is: Does this approach uh, work with membrane proteins with more than one transmembrane domain? And are good antibodies the limiting reagent for uh, applying your method? So two question in one. Yes. Uh, so it definitely, this method definitely work with uh, membrane proteins that has more than one TM uh, region. We have mm, quite a lot of examples in the SETSA HD format that we have worked with multi TM uh, protein. Good antibodies are always the um, limiting reagent. Um, we rely on good antibodies, of course, but there are many well-validated well good antibodies out there. Uh, and also, again, that we, uh, sets of validate uh, 46 targets, uh, new kits, and basically all of them work. And, and that's uh, saying something about that the antibodies are very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as mentioned, the, the uh, we are reliant on commercially available uh, antibodies, but there are usually uh, many available. And uh, the next question is, are there any limitations regarding the compound type? Can this, for example, be a applied uh, for studying Protax? Absolutely. We have uh, successful um, pro um, projects run on um, Protax. Uh, in MS Explore, for example, we have uh, done projects to look at both the abundance levels uh, using the Protax and also to study the Protax, but also look at the target engagement. And in the HD format, we have done uh, specifically on, on CDK4, for example, where we looked at target engagement of the the ligand uh, target and also the um, uh, warhead target. Thank you. Mm. Um, okay, there, there are a lot of questions coming in, so mm. we're just going to uh, skip uh, right to the next one. Uh, but if there's any follow up questions from an answer, uh, please just uh, <laughs> write another question in the chat. Um, and of course, in case we are not able to answer all questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to us via email as well. So the next question is regarding a paper from NSATS that mentioned that cells lose their integrity when heating at 58 to 60 degrees. 
if our target requires a higher temperature for a screen, uh, what might we get hits from more impermeable compounds? Yes, I would say so. Uh, absolutely. I think that it, the cell permeability could be also cell dependent. I know that bacteria, for example, they generally have a very uh, heat resistant cell wall, but uh, yes, uh, I would imagine so that at higher temperatures, the cell wall will, um, um, yeah, you will get hits from more impermeable compounds. It will become a semi lysate assay in a way. So to follow up on that question, um, how, how did you define the cutoff for hits? Did you see the dose response in the three doses that you screened? Yes, so the cutoff was de defined as it uh, typically is in screening, uh, three standard deviations away from the mean, uh, mean of the DMS controls. And did you see the dose response in the three doses screened? Uh, yes, we, I mean, um, we saw a dose response and also now when we have followed up the data, I have not uh, presented it here, but we do confirm the hits very nicely and they produce a nice concentration response in the full concentration response curves. Thank you. Moving on to the next nice, question. a lot of questions. Yeah, Very super nice. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Great, keep, keep them coming. Uh, always nice to have interesting discussions. So how sensitive is the alpha setsa in terms of identifying stack ranking of compounds? For example, if many compounds have closely related IC50s, uh, can alpha setsa separate these compounds from each other? Uh, I would definitely say that the setsa using alpha technology has the great potential of doing that. Depends on all, of course, the, uh, the compounds itself. They need to be um, soluble and nice behaving. But uh, our sets, are, especially the kits and, and also sets of assays we have developed are very sensitive and pick up small shifts in, in thermal stability. So yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we can detect the very small shifts and, and yeah. develop robust assays based on, yeah. based on that. And uh, the next question is, do you perform initial uh, TM optimization with purified protein? Uh, we generally don't use uh, or work with purified proteins uh, since uh, the structure can be quite different from the uh, endogenous protein in, within the cell. Uh, but sometimes we use pur purified proteins for looking at selectivity, for example, if we want to one antibody pair to be selective over another isoform, we sometimes use pur purified proteins. And to follow up on that from uh, the, in the same question, also, also in your experience, what percentage of targets are amenable to the SETSA format? Ooh, that's a, that's difficult, a one. difficult one, <laughs> but I, it's a very high success rate, I must say. But again, it depends on good antibodies. Uh, but I must say we haven't failed that many times to be to brag, <laughs> no, but it's it's a, I cannot say in a percentage, but uh, in many cases it works really well. Yes, I'd say in uh, almost all of the, most, absolutely the major part of all the assay development we've done has been successful. And usually if uh, uh, we uh, look at it like an in silico assessment beforehand, and if we don't think it's, uh, uh, like a feasible sets a target, for example, in a client in a client project, we wouldn't we wouldn't go ahead with that with that project if we didn't feel it would we would have a good chance of success. Mm. And the next question is: Have you ever compared heat identification in cell lysates with that in intact cells? Uh, I must think. No, we have not done that study. I'm thinking if the data that we showed the correlation was a biochemical assay and a cellular functional assay, but we have not done cell lysate versus intact cells, but that would be very interesting, of course. Yeah. Um, but we have not such, we haven't got that data set. Hmm. I think that we, uh, we kind of dragged out all the questions from the audience. <laughs> very nice with so many questions. Yes, thank you all for uh, uh, attending, uh, then there's uh, one more coming in. Mm. Um, so more of a technical questions. When processing alpha setsa in a 384 well plate, how do you go about heating the plate evenly and accurately? Mm. Is there any instruments we need to do this heating step? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so everything is done in PCR plates. So you then need a thermal cycler that is uh, um, for 384 well format, of course. Um, 
So we have that in the lab. We have a dual heat block that we can have two plates, but there's also possibility to do to heat the plates in, in water, for example, which is the standard well, from the beginning PCR machines were based on water, but we have a, a thermal uh, heat cycler in uh, three to four well format. Okay, so we have some we have some technical questions coming in here, uh, and the next one is: Do you clear heat shock lysates before transferring to alpha lysa detection plates? Um, if you mean that if we run an intact cell assay, if we do any clarification or centrifugation, that answer is no. In the um, SETSA um, or the using the alpha lysa technology, that assay is truly homogeneous. There's no um, um, centrifugation steps involved. So yes, no. The lysate is directly transferred without any uh, clarification. Okay, now we might have, we are at least starting to exhaust the questions, I think. Uh, please, if, any other, if you have any other questions, uh, please type them in. In the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, and thank you for, thank you for all the, the great questions. So we had uh, some time to discuss here in the end. And uh, as I mentioned previously, if you have uh, any, any follow-up questions after today's webinar, you're of course welcome to reach out to us at Pelago Bioscience or to uh, Perkin Elmer. And uh, with that, I think, um, thank you very much for, for attending and I wish you all a uh, good day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.